Coming up with this week in computer hardware, Asus ROG Delta Quad Deck gaming headset, MacBook keyboards are still a mess, new Ryzen 3000 CPUs means CPU bargains abound, Corsair's latest carbide case, and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 510, recorded on March 28th, 2019. Will Apple ever fix the MacBook keyboards? This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Hover. Register a domain name and build your online brand with Hover. Visit hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you the most useful, most delightful, most engaging, most affordable, most outrageous, most over-the-top, and generally speaking, the most practical, useful day-to-day -day stuff, whether we're talking mobile, desktop, or hey, anywhere. You've got the hardware, internet of stuff, consoles, we like it all, because you know what? It's all about doing things with the bits that do the things that are the reason you use computers in the first place. Sebastian, help me out here, man. <laughs> I... I have nothing to add to that, whatever that was. But yes, whatever the computers. terrible thing was. Computers, woo! Um, let me uh, turn the volume on my mic down a bit. It's uh, a kind of a chill week. You know, Apple did some yeah. announcements. They got a TV thing coming. They they got some software updates. They they made Siri a little more useful for Apple TV. Not really anything too hardware ish. Other than that, they're going to be offering uh, a, a collection, an arcade of exclusive games you'll be able to play across iOS and macOS and tvOS. Uh, you, uh, you were getting excited about a few things that were going on, but mostly I think you want to talk about the shiny new headset you reviewed from Asus. <laughs> is, yeah, is, that well, a, is that a fair assessment, sir? It, it can be very shiny, yes. Yeah, it's, it's got RGB lighting, which you can enable, but there's actually a hardware toggle for that, which is nice. You don't have to turn the... If you don't like RGBs, just flip a switch mm -hmm. on one of the ear cups instead of having to go through software. But RGBs aside, and I didn't really even pay attention to the RGB lighting when I was reviewing this, this is a very, very high-end headset. The, the first thing off the bat, we're talking about the uh, Asus ROG Delta mm -hmm. Quad DAC gaming headset. This is a USB-C headset, and that quad DAC comes via an ESS Sabre, I believe it's the 9218. It's a product that is actually a four DAC uh, SOC, like internally right. connected, internally uh, connected parallel quad DACs is what they call it. So very so should, high. Go ahead. I was going to say we should put in context for the for the non audio audiophile stereo nerds in the audience. Um, when you start getting into fancy digital analog converters, uh, you you get to a high end DAC. You've you've probably heard names like Burr Brown, and of course, um, uh, AKM is one of my favorites right now. Saber, the ESS Saber DACs, which is what Sebastian is talking about here. That's the digital analog converter. And then as you step up, um, you start doing things like using multiple DACs, maybe one for each channel. Or in the case of some crazy over the top of the you know cost of a decent Mercedes audio file gear, you may have four DACs uh, for each channel of audio. So a total of eight DACs uh, in their entirety or things that are so crazy, uh, I can't even begin to explain to them here, but they, they sound like they violate the laws of physics and certainly uh, cost nearly as much as a decent midsize sedan. But quad DAX is, I don't think we've ever seen that in a gaming headset and almost never seen it in any type of headset. Yeah, I've never heard of it before. And this ES9218 product has only been around for a couple of years, I think. They announced mm -hmm. it at the end of 2016, I think. So, it, very capable. I mean, I've been using an ESS DAC in my personal digital audio player for like five years now, which is a predecessor of this one. And not quite the same numbers. Like you were kind of breaking down what a DAC is. There's different statistics, like these specs that go along with digital analog conversion. Not just how accurately it can do it, but with how much noise or the lack of noise, very low distortion, right. 
a high signal to noise ratio is always good. The more dynamic range you can get out of it, the better. And this part can do up to 130 decibels, 130 decibels of signal to noise ratio, which is extremely high. Right. The implementation here from ASUS is 127 decibels is how they're rating it. And what's interesting about this is because the design incorporates RGB lighting, that means there is the potential for switching noise as the RGBs are controlled by what's called a PWM uh, lighting controller. So there's pulse width modulation, high frequency noise can be uh, mm -hmm. created. So they actually, one of the features of this is that they have a multi-layer PCB where two of the layers are just grounding in between the PWM circuit and anything audio related. So they're very careful with the design of this to make sure that even though it does incorporate RGBs, that shouldn't affect the sound quality at all. And I, this thing was dead quiet when I was listening to it. I don't, you don't hear any hiss. You don't hear any kind of high pitched noises or anything when you're using your computer with it. And just overall sound quality, stereo sound quality, I found to be superb. It's mm -hmm. it, it has more in common with the sound of what you'd expect from like high end, like audiophile style headphones in like the two to three hundred dollar range. Right. And it's a gaming headset, so of course that means there's like software enabled virtual surround effects that you can turn on. There's different presets you can make your own presets, and you can do all the EQ and all that stuff with uh, the. They call it the Armory 2 software. And I ended up... Did you... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I was just oh, going to say, I ended up playing with the, the appropriately enough, the gaming preset. But, oh, weird. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, well, I, I, okay, I should, I should, you know, I, so often we review gaming headsets, um, and people don't realize that that a lot of game makers spend a tremendous amount of time and treasure to create really amazing soundtracks for their systems or for their for their games. Uh, and then a lot of times you will have someone come in and be like, "We're going to use psychoacoustics to make everything seem bigger," or "You're going to get surround sound out of two discrete drivers, one for each." ear which doesn't really work that way you can kind of expand it this way but it doesn't really go behind you but um a lot of the times when you turn on these the the room effect the spatializing effect the sound expansion effect it goes from being a you know a decent headphone to wow that really sounds awful so for sebastian to be like i played in gaming <laughs> mode is actually high praise because <laughs> you're um, well put you know, because i've definitely uh, had headsets where Really good stereo sound, and as soon as you turn on those spatial effects, the simulated 5.1 or even, you know, 7.1 effects, which are never, I've, I've almost never heard anything that convinced me there was sound coming from behind me. Maybe a little bit, yeah. a little bit behind my ear, but these do that like front surround really well, where you have center and then front left right, and then the side left right, so you can do like a 5.1 mix with them pretty convincingly, mm -hmm. but. The spatial effect did not degrade the sound. In fact, it, it actually made it better, I thought. It just it gave it a slight bass emphasis. These are a very neutral headphone. So without any EQ, if you leave it in the leave it in the flat setting, no, no spatial effects or anything turned on, they're they don't accentuate bass at all, which is unusual for a gaming headset. Right. I would say like eight out of ten that come down have a little bit of a smile EQ where you have higher bass, maybe a little bit of uh, reduced mid-range, and then maybe a little bit of increased treble, which make them sound more detailed. And it, it kind of like sucks out some of the mid-range, so yeah. that the mid-range detail is lost. It also tends These to are, exhaust your ears in a fairly short period of time when you have that sort of artificially elevated high end. There's also a lot of audio files that kind of live for that because it, it gives sparkle and detail uh, until you're to the point where your ears actually ache and you have to stop listening to music. <laughs> yeah, and I, I get to that point pretty quickly with overly emphasized bass too. I, mm -hmm. I appreciate that bass is probably the most popular frequency if we were to start talking about, you know, Everybody's right. favorite frequency is probably, you know, 60 to 100 hertz. And they, you know, car audio systems can attest to this. They're, they seem to be tuned for the, the really low bass. But this doesn't really have that. So when you enable something like gaming mode, it gives you a little bit of a boost there. So it makes it sound more full and it makes explosions and things sound more powerful. But it the 
echo effects, like the reverb effects that are enabled by default. There's a, a very good effect just called Studio, which mm -hmm. basically emulated a room, a, like a, the acoustic environment of a small room. And it almost convinced me a couple times when I was playing a game that I was hearing the sound from like near field monitors on my desk instead of headphones. Oh, so wow. that alone, very interesting. yeah, it just, everything was just a little bit more emphasized, but nothing crazy. I didn't feel like sounds were flying around the room or going behind my ears, but I was very impressed with the subtlety and the quality of the effects. And that just complemented the fact that it's a two channel pair of headphones. And I walked around for a couple of days and listened to these as just standard headphones plugged into a Galaxy S9 Plus, which of course uh, has By a headphone USB jack. But yeah, yep. Oh, cool. So any, you can actually use these with an Apple device if you want to do the daisy chain of like USB-C <laughs> to USB to Apple, what is it, the, there's a connection kit, a USB connection kit to Lightning. The USB camera connection kit or the, yeah. yeah. There's and several different of variations on it. Yeah, I've I've done the ridiculous daisy chain of things to plug into my iPhone before to test out a portable DAC, but I did not do that this time. I, I saved myself and just plugged it right into the Galaxy phone. And it worked perfectly. You know, everything, like the, the volume rocker on the headset changed the volume on the phone. Everything worked exactly like it was supposed to work. And it sounded great as a phone headset. So pretty versatile if you have an Android phone, especially this this could become mm -hmm. your favorite pair, of, like walking around music headphones too. But cables. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I haven't I haven't heard the AirPods 2 yet, so I can't really comment on those. But you know, it for the price, and I was kind of worried you get a high end pair of headphones in. Like I get some high end gaming headsets sometimes, and we've seen stuff up to like three hundred dollars, I think, before. Right. And I was kind of worried about these because I'm reading about the specs and the technology. Price isn't that bad. It's one seventy nine retail. So that's actually it's up there. I it's it uh, it isn't it isn't because there's there are a lot of uh, man I I don't want to climb up on a soapbox and start howling at the moon but there are a lot of expensive headsets that are eighty percent design and really really cool plastic molds and LEDs and they spend about two percent of the parts budget on the actual drivers themselves I mean it's interesting right the the ear pads you're looking at those were probably inspired. Uh, you know, distantly or not so distantly, those those look like they were inspired by Mr. Speaker's uh, Aeron planar magnetics. Um, we've seen uh, Odyssey doing the Mobius headphone, which uh, is a really is one of those things where if they just concentrated on stereo audio, I think they would have been a lot happier. But they decided to do a whole lot of additional things. Um, but the you know there were noise issues with that. Um, their the the 3D programming effects weren't very good. You know, and they were asking four hundred dollars for that. Um, I've seen one hundred and fifty to two hundred fifty dollar gaming headsets that sounded like. A typical $80 headphone, not a good $80 headphone like a Sony MD70, uh, MDR7506, but a jank $80 headphone. Um, so for it to be $180, stylish, well-built, and decent audio is actually, I think, a lot more rare than people realize. Um, and much more rare than yeah. it should be in the gaming headset world. And I always forget to talk about this, but the comfort level, which matters a lot, if you're especially if you're gaming for long periods of time, right? These are not that heavy. First of all, they're around thirteen and a half ounces, I think, and very soft. Like they, it comes with two sets of ear pads. One of them is kind of your thicker uh, fabric mesh style, and uh, mm -hmm. those were the alternates. The ones that come shipped on it are this protein leather, very soft, a little bit less padding but lower profile against your head and they matched the padding that's uh built into the the headband very soft i found them to be very comfortable the adjustability was great not only do they rotate all the way flat in one direction i have a lot i've had a lot of headphones that either don't rotate the other way or barely rotate right. the other way and these rotated the other way like a good 20 30 degrees so extremely like con they conformed to your head very well and then quite adjustable. So it, and then the last thing, the microphone was actually way above average. I did one of our, uh, podcasts a couple weeks ago for the site 
wearing the headset mm -hmm. and the mic audio wasn't up there with a dedicated mic like this high LPR 40 I'm using right now, but it was, didn't sound like, you know, a plain old telephone call, like a lot of gaming headsets do, where there's just like a little bit of mid range sound. It was a lot more full. So good. Pretty impressed overall. Uh, something we should be more of when it comes to gaming headsets, I think, uh, especially given the prices that some of the vendors are starting to push, um, where $200 is the new $160. And I'm impressed. I mean, I, I, I saw it and I, I like Asus. Um, uh, I am much more impressed than I expected to be, uh, by your description. I'll be very curious to hear them if I get a chance. Um, yeah. You know, were you irritated at all that they weren't wireless? No, no. I, I've, okay. We get plenty of wireless headphones in, and I've heard some really good ones lately. And, you know, we've it kind of goes back and forth on whether they want to do Bluetooth or... Because that enables, of course, many more devices that can be connected to it and appeals sure. to a wider audience. But then you have some of those latency issues, especially especially with, like, watching movies and stuff where you have lip sync issues. And so a lot of them well, still then, prefer to use that 2.4 I mean, gigahertz... Yeah, I mean, it's funny because like I'm sitting here with like, oh, look, it's a dongle. Um, <laughs> it's like a 2.4 gigahertz dongle. But with the latest versions of Bluetooth, by the time you get to Bluetooth 4.2 and 5, especially with 5, you shouldn't have latency issues. Um, shouldn't. Uh, you know, I'm also looking at a set of speakers from a, a manufacturer whose speakers I love, but I, I put them next to the monitor. And you were talking earlier about picking up noise. And um, I spent... Uh, on and off for two days tracking down uh, this very small noise that was being picked up somewhere. Um, and I finally figured out it was the speakers were close enough to the monitor that they were picking up um, uh, the refresh on the monitor because uh, it timed out close enough. And when I unplugged the speaker, the noise went away. And when I unplugged the monitor, the noise went away. Uh, but what was interesting for that for me is, is I've, I've got a JDS Labs Atom, which is a really magnificently engineered uh, headphone amp. And John Sieber over at JDS spent a lot of time working on this. And this $99 headphone amp uh, tests better than some amps that cost a lot more. And it also, unlike the you know eleven hundred dollar pair of speakers on my desk, didn't pick up any of the noise from the other devices or you know from the monitor the way the expensive audiophile speakers did, which I found kind of fascinating, um, because uh, it's also uh, picks up less noise than some more expensive products that uh, I believe. Uh, the crew at JDS Labs are in the process of redesigning based on it because they, John spent about a year working on the circuit board and the layout and how the components were working uh, and how they were isolated from each other to drop the noise level as far as he could and to uh, reduce EMF interference. And it's, you know, spending money in audio is no guarantee of excellent performance, you know, and looking at a product like these Asus, you know, which cost half as less than half as much as some of the, uh, uh, headsets we've seen coming out for gaming or, for example, that $99 JDS Labs uh, Atom headphone app. It's amazing what engineers can do if they have the time to really design things well and to put the product together well. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about that as a lot as I've seen some high-end audio products that were kind of, you know, very pretty, um, but not necessarily performing uh, any better than things that were considerably less expensive. Uh, I think it just climbed up on my soapbox again. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, I was looking, trying to identify that one. You said it's which which model of the headphone amp is that? Uh, JDS Labs Atom. It's one they released okay. uh, a few months ago. And I wonder if they're actually back in stock because they, they kind of blew up on them and they ran out of power supplies. Okay, they're in stock again. Yeah. Yeah, JDS Labs, the Atom amp. Um, I use that with gotcha. one of their uh, EL DACs, which has an, uh, an AKM uh, digital analog converter in it, which I am severe. I I think ideally, um, all DACs, when done correctly, should sound exactly a lot alike. Dot dot dot. The circuitry surrounding them makes a huge difference, and also I I think you know there's a sort of some decisions made between the programming on an ESS DAC versus some of the later AKM DACs versus some other DACs where they some do a better job than others or are more musical than others. But this is also 
something that's almost impossible to test for objectively other than to make sure you know jitter is eliminated and the basic job is done well but it's 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 crazy when you talk about reducing noise um how difficult that is to do or how difficult it is to actually finish off i've been reading a lot of of uh, audio benchmarks lately um and i'll stop now because i will put everybody to sleep <laughs> possibly even you sebastian <laughs> No, let's let's talk about roll off. Let's talk about some of the choices that are made in DAX, but no, oh, maybe not today. Man. DAC filters talking about that makes me just want to fall asleep because uh, you know I keep reading these articles discussing the incredible difference, and and then I listen to stuff and like, mm. <laughs> okay, I don't, I didn't find that life changing. In fact, I've. Barely found it noticeable. Very noticeable. You got another uh, carbide series case in from Corsair, the 678C low noise tempered glass case. You've been busy yes. this week, man. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, multiple it's reviews subtle. done and working on even more. <laughs> but yes, you said subtle. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, for a, I don't see any shiny lights up front. Uh, there is a giant glass door on it, but it's it's chill in there. I also you know, saw this, a major unicorn vomit PC build lately that I think uh, I think I counted nine fans inside of it, all of which were doing sort of rainbow blasts. So it was like uh, Cuckoo Cloudland from the Lego movie. <laughs> once you get started, maybe, you know, there are people who have addictions to things, Patrick, and maybe RGB lighting is one of them. And you put one fan in and you, that's not enough. And then there's 12 fans later. You run out of space, and there's like underglow lighting and backlighting, and you know, just your average Twitch streamer in 2019. Uh, anyway, back to subtle RGB less enclosures with you know plain non lighted fans. This is an effort from Corsair. The last Corsair case I looked at a couple weeks ago was their Crystal series, which all glass, you know, on most of the sides and RGB lighting. This one doesn't have that. Very much in the style of fractal design, uh, right down to the brushed finish on the front, and in many ways, very similar to the Define R6, the latest generation mm -hmm. of that popular Define low noise case series. So Corsair's take on it is very similar styling to that. It still offers an optical bay, which is nice if you still want to put a Blu-ray drive in there, and has excellent component clearance support, good cooling support. There's sound damping panels on the top, which is that you can actually switch out just like with the fractal case. There's a mesh filter for the top. Uh, you can put in a, a solid panel that is um, lined with the same noise damping material that's behind the front door, which opens and closes with a magnetic closure. And also the rear panel has some very thick noise damping material in it. So they've taken some steps to... Mm -hmm. Reduce the overall noise, even though the fans that come pre-installed, there are 340 millimeter fans in this that are not loud. So overall, just super understated. And I will point out the glass panel on this. There's a lot of cases with tempered glass. Fewer of them are hinged. This is of the hinged variety. So it closes with, with magnets and then it's on a sturdy hinge. You never have to find like lose thumb screws or try to you know I've, I've definitely with all the tempered glass cases even though i'm lucky enough never to have broken a tempered glass side panel yet i've definitely lost a little thumb screws before where you take the side panel off you go to put it back on and now you only have three thumb screws for some reason and the other one just never materializes again so I, i'm always a fan of any kind of door that opens on a hinge or has some sort of a latch built into it it's just it's so much easier to, to manage and that's definitely a selling point in this favor. But thermal and noise performance, you know, it's, it's an enclosure. A lot of this is going to be dependent on the components that you use. Although I will say, even though this is built for silence, the airflow is better than I expected. There is mm -hmm. just the one intake uh, surrounding that front door. And this it's is a completely pretty big closed intake. off. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a big intake, but... Uh, like Fractal's take on this is to put like holes all around the door and there are none to be found here. They 
definitely took it to the next level as far as trying to make this as quiet as possible where there's just one slot down at the bottom of the door. But I think that they were saved by their decision to make the bottom of the case. I have at least one picture in, in the review. You can see the bottom of the case, which is like a shroud that covers the, the power right. supply and you know, cable mess and stuff. It has perforations like all over it. So, yeah. Air is drawn up through the bottom through a screen filter, is drawn right up through the sort of false bottom of the case and allows a lot more air in than otherwise would have been the case with that very small opening in the front panel. So long story I short, think... better airflow than expected. I, I, I've got one of the earlier uh, uh, Carbide Series 600Q, which I'm, I'm kind of glancing over here because it's right down there. Uh, and for that one... They did a couple of interesting choices where it had a similar panel up front. One, I love the fact that they put the the actual uh, dust catcher, cat fur catcher, on the front of the outside of that. Because with this one, uh, it's really, really awkward to clean. This older case, it's awkward to clean uh, uh, the screening on that. But they do also have the screening on the bottom. And I want to say that the screening on the bottom with the airflow going in, you can see some – I have some amazing pictures of what that looks like after about six months uh, if uh, you don't – if you live in a house with children and and pets um and it's something you want to it's easier to forget that it's down there on the bottom but because it's on the bottom and drawing air in it will gather copious amounts of dust and fur and mayhem um so uh, you know I've, you know it's it's interesting also to see how they've changed the design because with mine they've got sort of this strange uh, there's the faint front plate and then there's like a one inch gap all the way around where the air gets pulled through and it looks like they kind of cleaned up some of that to make it a little quieter. I also realized that I may have finally run a system for so long for the first time in years. Uh, I'm going to need to upgrade the fans and replace the fans on it. So uh, it's going to be interesting to sort of tear this thing down and see if it's actually the fans or if there's something restricting uh, airflow through the fans that are giving them the, uh, the noise I'm hearing. It's it's funny though because for so, for so long I was changing cases so often I never really wore out any fans so I'm kind of like oh I think those are bearings that are going they're not squealing yet but the fans are actually making more noise and I'm like oh, did I wear them out did I finally kill them <laughs> it's been a while yeah I, it it's been a very long time for me too I spent five years reviewing cases so you know you review one case and then it's take all the components out onto the next so I never had components in a case for longer than a week. Which, oh. you know, I always have nice clean fans and I haven't cleaned a screen filter in five years. So there's that. <laughs> there's that. Yeah. <laughs> These are positive things. Oh, my goodness. The uh, Asus AMD 5 X570 motherboard lineup leaked Ryzen CPU discounts. Um it's kind of mad to see uh, a good, art, uh, good article up on hothardware.com. Uh, Paul Lilly wrote this one up. Um we know that Ryzen 3000 is coming this summer. I think we're all excited about that. Seven nanometer, yeah. seven nanometer, seven nanometer. Take that intel. Uh, I am looking forward to reduced prices and more power and, and maybe upgrading my 1800X. But this is uh, uh, this was interesting. <laughs> yeah, there's you know, a, there's a lot going on here. I, I found one article that sort of condensed it all because there have been right. leaks of like motherboard lineups for this uh, 500 series, for the 3000 series of Ryzen processors that are coming. But there have also been reports of prices being slashed all over the place on the existing right. Ryzen parts. And the biggest discounts I could find were on Amazon, which are still ongoing. And they're pretty significant depending on the CPU you're looking at. So I know that the new CPUs are coming, and I know they're exciting. <laughs> but if you want a build today, it's pretty tempting to look at some of these prices. We're talking like yeah. the six core Ryzen 5 2600 is down to $165. And you can get a 2600X for $189. Mm -hmm. Some of the, the biggest discount is probably the Ryzen 7 2700, which is only $219. That was a $300 part at launch that consistently sells for around $289 or so. That's so, huge. And to put this into context, right, uh, the 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 2700X launched at 330. It's down to 290 dollars, uh, you know, at the at the sale pricing. That's 200 dollars less than I paid for my 1800X at launch, and that was the retail price. So 
you're getting a huge amount of power for the money on this one. Um, and it's pretty, uh, it's pretty exciting to see that. Yeah. And, you know, doubtless we're going to see eight core parts at, at good prices when Ryzen 3000 launches, but we'll see if they're any more aggressive than this. I, I can't imagine that they would be. This is retailers trying to clear inventory and, they're, they're starting a little bit earlier this time. I looked it up this morning. Mm-hmm. We were talking last night, like, is does this correspond with the release of Ryzen 2000 when they started discounting those original parts? And it doesn't. That They actually started those discounts kind of in mid-April last year mm-hmm. with the launch, I believe, late that month. So only a couple weeks beforehand and didn't really clear as much inventory, I think, as they would like because... If you look, there's a lot of those 1000 series Ryzen parts still in the retail channels, including on Amazon and other places where they're significantly discounted, like original Threadripper parts, 1000 Ryzen stuff. Mm -hmm. So they're starting early to try to get through it. I I think it's smart. I mean, my my big sigh there was because I was excited about the 2700X and I was a little frustrated by the pricing that it launched at because it was a bit faster than the 1800X and it was a lot less expensive uh, at launch. But it's not a particularly compelling upgrade if you already have an 1800X unless you're the kind of person that's like, oh, another 10, 15% performance. I'll totally drop $300 on that and get a new motherboard. Um, So I, I think they're probably trying to work and you know if you are buying a new processor there is no point to buying an 1800x or a 1700x if you can get uh, a 2700x or a 2700 for not that much more money but these are also i mean all of these parts going back to the original ryzen parts are fantastic uh if you are doing any kind of work that requires you throwing lots of cores at it yes individual core performance can be beaten by an intel part um but you're generally paying a tremendous amount of money Uh, to get the same number of cores. That's changed in the last year, uh, and I expect it's going to change a lot more given all the forces at work, given all the hardware reviewers that are now proselytizing in front of Intel and explaining why people might buy non-Intel parts. Um, Curious to see how that works out over the next year or two. But uh, the other thing to remember is is that... uh, that Wraith Spire LED that comes with the 2700 is actually a really, really good cooler, and the Wraith Spire does a decent job. Um, you know, So it's nice to actually see a factory overcooler that's not immediately something to toss into a dustbin or give to your dog to play with or let your kids you know, attach to their Xbox or something. Um, you know, If you are looking to minimize expenses. So yeah, that's it's it's another value add because if you look at it, most people go for like that thirty-ish dollar price range. We've talked about the mm-hmm. Hyper Two Twelve Evo extensively, and these processors come with a cooler that's pretty good. And Intel's <laughs> enthusiast stuff does not ship with a cooler at all. So yeah, it, and another great thing about the Ryzen stuff is they've forced Intel to increase their core counts, which I think we've also talked about. It it, it was not, I I never imagined that within like the last year or so we would see a core i5 product come out with six cores and i don't think Intel did either four? <laughs> no so amd has definitely forced them to change their product stack and increase core counts because like you said maybe this isn't winning on uh, instructions per clock and it'll be fascinating to see what kind of gains amd might have made there by the time we get the 3000 parts in hand but yeah, yeah if maybe if it's like 10 to 20 percent slower IPC, it's still more cores for the same amount of money or a lot less money, especially if you get one of these on sale. Get yourself eight cores for 220 bucks right now is pretty crazy. If by crazy you mean awesome, I will agree with you, sir. So <laughs> I don't know. I'm just kind of stoked. Not, uh, not to be stoked about, to be frustrated by, to be irritated by. Um, a nice, uh, nice opinion piece over at Macworld.com by uh, Michael Slyman. Apple's apology for the MacBook keyboard only proves that we need a new MacBook keyboard. And if you have not been paying attention um, to the MacBook keyboards in the last couple of years, uh, well, I guess about th- almost four years now. So Apple came up with a butterfly mechanism, uh, a new t- device, a new uh way of backing the pressure on the key uh, to minimize the amount of Z it was intruding because everything has to be thinner. And they uh, they have issues with dust 
they are loud, they break. Um, and Apple's never really been like, no, 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 there's, there's nothing wrong with these keyboards. And then they released a completely redesigned version that included, amongst other things, plastic to protect the apparently incredibly sensitive butterfly mechanism from dust intrusion. And no, 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 no. That's not an admission that the original design was flawed. Uh, and over time, uh, they eventually launched uh, the keyboard service program for MacBook and MacBook Pro. Uh, so basically, anybody who bought one between 2015 and 2017, uh, if if letters or characters repeat, uh, if, if keys don't work, if keys are erratic in the response, if the keys basically suck or are broken, uh, there is at least a possibility that uh, if you speak nicely to a genius, they will do their best to get you hooked up with a functioning keyboard for your uh, expensive and not Apple expensive, just period. It sucks to spend a thousand or two or three thousand dollars on something and then have the one of the two most important components that make it usable uh, fall apart. Uh, so, you know, they added the silicon membrane and Oh, here we go. Uh, there's a wonderful quote in here. Longtime journalist and Apple user Joanna Stern wrote a column for the Wall Street Journal this week that absolutely excoriates the keyboard on the newest I MacBook Air, which just so happens to be the same one that was supposed to cure the MacBook Pro's problems. She writes of, quote, the pain of using an Apple laptop keyboard that's failed after four months and an insanely maddening experience, end quote. And end quote. Um, you know, this is a... This is an interesting point, right? Because the one of the big takeaways from the event that Apple held this week, we mentioned earlier that there was really no hardware and there were minimal updates to hardware, uh, is, is Apple's like, woo, we're doing Netflix. We're going to spend a bunch of money on content. We don't know what that content's going to be. Well, Oprah's here and Mr. Spielberg's here and Reese Witherspoon's here and a bunch of other people were there. And uh, it seemed to be a declaration that they were going to make more money on services. And it would be really, really nice if they, you know, and I understand that the that, that MacBook sales are, are a very modest portion of their revenue and, and that iPhone sales are down and that they are searching for big ticket items to make more money on. And apparently it's easier to make more money on content uh, for Apple than it is to make money on on making MacBooks that suck less. Um, but this is, uh, you know, the, the nice thing that Joanna Stern did uh, was, uh, uh, you know, posting the article so that all of the E's and R's were missing because the E and R yeah. key died on her laptop, which uh, is brutal and awesome. And I stand up on my seat and clap. Um, you know, uh, it's, you know, I've used a lot of laptops. Uh, I have worn off the key coding on at least three laptops in the last five years just with my regular everyday work because I write a lot. I basically write for a living. Uh, I test products. I write about them. I test products. I write about them. I write scripts. I write more scripts. We write emails to get the products, to get the stuff, to write the scripts and the stories. Um, so, and I will say, I've had keyboards get sloppier over time. That's just the nature of physical devices. Um, just like, you know, the bearings in a car wear out over time. Um, you know, the mechanical contacts in a keyboard will wear out over time. But it's abysmal to have something that's a luxury device that's falling apart, um, you know, within the first six months, within the first year, within the first two years. So, you know... It would be nice also, and, and Apple has always been abysmal about this. Um, you know, Apple likes to apologize after they've been taken to court and beaten with a hammer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, I have, a, I have a lot of thoughts about this too. I've been, whether whatever side you're on, and I would assume that a lot of our viewers probably are not big Apple fans. You know, if, if the kind of people it's who, a mix. Yeah, if you appreciate value and and want to build your own system and you care a lot about your system, then very often you're on the PC side of things. Right. Uh, a lot of people, some people hackintosh. That's the thing. But on the portable side, it's it's very personal because. A laptop becomes this thing, and it depends on how you work and what you do for a living. But you talked about being a writer, essentially. A lot of people who write, their laptop is their life. They 
They have yeah. important files on there. They are constantly using it. They are taking it with them everywhere they go. When they get the urge to write or just because they have no choice but to take it with them because they have a project <laughs> to do or they're finishing a paper or finishing a review or writing a script, that laptop has to work. So reliability is absolutely key. I find it ridiculous that the obsession with thin has resulted in these choices that they work from the standpoint that they can ship it out the door and it functions properly. But the what kind of long-term testing do they do to this particular design? Because it has been problematic from the outset and it's people who've used it for a few months. You've pressed on these keys enough times that the certain ones start to stick or don't register anymore. And looking at it, just some of these very close up shots, like what we're seeing it, it's, it's such a delicate, ultra thin mechanism. There are so many potential issues with it. Something that was a little bit larger, but more simplistic, like the, the good old scissor mechanism works just fine. And there are alternatives and, there's a lot of different technologies out there, like dedicated low-profile key switches and that sort of thing that we've seen on laptops. But for more than one reason, not just the problems with the keyboard, Apple laptops are, in my opinion anyway, no longer world-class. There was a time when, regardless of which side of the fence right. you were on, uh, a MacBook product, like a MacBook Pro, was the best laptop in the world. And you could, you could try to convince yourself otherwise because it was $2,000 plus, but they were really good. I can't speak for the longevity of them because they've been plagued with issues. There's a reason Apple and NVIDIA don't do business anymore. And it's because of overheating issues and problems with chipsets in the past. And that was a MacBook Pro problem that plagued them for years. They switched to, over to AMD stuff and they don't have those kinds of issues anymore. But now there, there's issues with screens, issues with keyboards. Pretty much the only thing that's been a constant as far as like best in industry is their trackpad. I don't think there's a better trackpad on any laptop as long as you're using Mac OS because the trackpads are not nearly as good with the Windows drivers, but we could talk about input on laptops all day. But my point is, I don't, I don't know if it's just because Steve Jobs is gone and whether you loved him or hated him as galvanizing as he was. He was the kind of person where if somebody that he respected told him that something was crap or was a problem, it would probably get changed or go away. And it's been multiple generations of the same problematic stuff from Apple right. now where, you know, Apple fans who use their products for a living are now writing scathing articles, criticizing their most important product, which you know, oh, by the way, only has a couple of USB Type-C ports on the side and there's no <laughs> real connectivity or expansion anymore, all in the name of being as thin as possible. And I'll stop now. I think we're, we're both united in being frustrated with thin uh, as being a goal. <laughs> a How benchmark about more powerful, for better cooling, better keyboard, Bigger longer battery, battery life? Yeah, like I would take, you look at how thin a MacBook Pro is, which is basically as thin as a MacBook Air. Not quite at the very front edge, but it's close. And you think about rugged workhorse style laptops like the ThinkPad, like even some of the thinner ThinkPads, like the X200 series. They're considerably thicker than a MacBook Pro, have bigger batteries, have, you know, some, some laptops actually still have removable batteries too, which is, you know, I know a novel it's concept. It's crazy. Yeah. Oh, look, look at here's that. Yep. a keyboard that works. Hey, look. And, yeah. Here's a Dell XPS 13. Also has this thing. Oh, my goodness. The number of hours I put on this keyboard. Um, I've done terrible things with this keyboard. I don't know if you can see it, but I've actually worn the texture off of a couple of the keys on here. Uh, just barely. They actually did some amazing things with the uh, finish on these keys. But And that's, that's a yeah. thin keyboard, too. Those XPS keyboards are really, that's a thin laptop. It is so a they, thin they've laptop. somehow managed to produce a reliable keyboard on a thin laptop. 
And they've got USB-C and USB, and they've got an SD card slot. I, you know, it, it's it's frustrating because I understand on one level that Apple's like, we're going to change the aesthetics of these. We're going to move the user forward into a beautiful USB-C future, which conveniently involves us selling a whole bunch of real expensive dongles. And don't think you're going to be buying third-party stuff because we're going to ka have a certification program that makes sure their stuff is just about as expensive as ours. Um, I'm a little, but you know, I can also say we've, we've seen a lot of laptops where it's been like, Oh, you know, we'll do USB. You know, there's a, a Huawei I, I looked at recently, which was a, an Ultrabook with a discrete GPU inside of it, which is really fascinating to me. Right. Cause it's, it was gaming and, it has some battery life issues, which I hope will be cleaned up with a firmware update. But the biggest challenge on that was was simple things like, well, you can you do USB charging on this side, uh, and you can, but you have to use this port for your monitor. So if you have a monitor with USB C and charging, that's not really going to work. You're still going to need to use. Oh, that's both your USB. -C. Oh goodness, um, you can get a USB C hub, you know, and it's just like there's moments where I'm like engineers should be using their products. And I'm sure that the engineers at Apple are using their products, but they have to be, I don't know. We, uh, this is, we could talk a long time about this. <laughs> <laughs> we should take a moment to thank Hover. Building your online brand, people, has never been more important. The heart of an online brand Heart of your brand is buying a domain name. If you don't own your domain name, where can people find you? Right? Buy a domain name for your passion. It's the first and biggest step to building your personal brand online. Keeping your domain name separate from hosting gives you the flexibility to choose the right platform for your business. Do you want your tools to work? And think about it. If the only place people can find you is on, you know, certain social media sites, if that social media site changes its rules or if it falls out of favor, then all of a sudden you're gone. Your customers are gone. You need a domain name, you know, and quite frankly, if you haven't noticed, pretty much everybody has one. My friend's cat has its own domain name. Sebastian Beak benchmarks all night long while drinking decaf.com, which I really should buy because it just sounds too stupid not to, but, um, you know, domain names are inexpensive and it's kind of crazy. When you look at Hover, it is easy to make a domain name stand out because they have over 400 domain extensions to choose from. The .me TLD top level domain is uh, is a really cool one that people have been getting into lately. .me, it's a unique extension, right? It's it's for you, your portfolio, your website, your, your resume, right? It's going to showcase who you are, what you do. And if you got a portfolio or website ready to launch, you really should get the .me extension. Take advantage of their .me sale. Best in class customer support team, no upsells, clean and simple user experience and interface. Um, but Hover, you know, things look nice in there. Personalized email that matches your domain so you have a clean identity that everybody can track online. The Hover Connect feature allows you to connect your domain name to many website builders with just a few simple clicks. You know, if you haven't used Hover, you really should give it a try. Get a domain on there. Buy a domain. Experiment with a domain. Buy a domain for your wife, for her birthday, for the kids, for the dog, for your favorite project, for your hobby. This year, find a domain name for your passion. Visit hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. That's hover.com slash twit for 10% off your domain extension for a full year. And we want to thank Hover for their support of this weekend computer hardware. I like domain names. <laughs> Sadly, I lost the slamdance.com domain name. Oh, why? Are you uh, are you playing Anthem or are you mostly benchmarking with Anthem at this point? Uh, neither to this point. Um, I have not jumped on the bandwagon. I have I feel like I hate I say this every week, but I just don't have time. I haven't <laughs> played a game for fun in a while. It's old games when they get released on like GOG, which we may talk about shortly, that get me excited because I'm like, oh, I remember that game. It's kind of remembering a time when I could just play a game for like four hours straight, which hasn't happened probably since before my son was born. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you play Anthem, and I know it's not the most popular uh, game, 
which I'm sure EA Bioware would love it to be. But patch 1.0.4 came out for the game a couple of days ago. And what it does is add, well, it, it does a bunch of things. You have to check out the release notes to see all the stuff they've changed and added. But crucially for NVIDIA users, if you have an RTX card, and we've talked about ray tracing, we've talked about DLSS before. Right. This enables that DLSS, the deep learning super sampling feature. So if you wanted to use the real-time ray tracing effects, it's give, it gives you those gains of up to 40%. The same uh, percentages we saw with their Battlefield 5 DLSS update. So as they continue working on DLSS, it apparently has been getting better, and it certainly gives you higher performance. And testing the game, which is not the most challenging game, they provided a chart that showed it at 4K with all the settings maxed out, and even an RTX 2060 was getting you close, like 39, 40 frames per second with this DLSS uh, feature enabled versus under 30 frames per second with it disabled. So it goes from not really playable to fairly playable and up to like a 2080 where you're then closing in on like 55 frames per second and then well over 60 with the 2080 Ti. So if you have that hardware, then this update just gives you the ability to play around with real-time ray tracing and maybe make something that wasn't playable, playable. And then it also enables something called highlights, which I've not played with myself. It's one of those things built into GeForce experience where the game will have certain scenarios where it will automatically kind of preload highlights mm -hmm. of what you just did and let you immediately like say, oh, I'm going to send this to my favorite social media you know, site and then you know, game highlights from a boss fight you just beat something like that <laughs> that video clip goes up so just for anthem players the patch has a lot of stuff including those like dlss and nvidia highlights goodies for free so it's exciting and of course they have a demo uh, video if you want to watch dlss on versus <laughs> off oh my goodness uh, it's been interesting to uh, it's been interesting to watch people debate uh, the Huawei uh, ban. I'll just call it the Huawei ban here in the United States uh, by the United States government. And one of the things came out uh, earlier today, an article by uh, Adam Satariano on the New York Times. Uh, that apparently, British authorities found defects. Um, in uh, Huawei products. So they uh, got deep into uh, the telecom stuff, you know, the switch type stuff, the stuff that telephone companies and cell phone companies buy and, and, and internet companies buy. Um, they uh, said there were, quote, underlying defects uh, in the software engineering and security processes that governments or independent hackers could exploit posing risks to national security. Uh, it you know, did not go the full American and, and ban the equipment, uh, but it was uh, it was basically saying don't buy this stuff. Uh, and it's it's going to be interesting because with the five G rollout and the prices that Huawei offers on five G, um, it is going to be enormously tempting for a lot of countries to opt into their system. This is a a huge battle for the next generation of telecommunications equipment to bring 5G online, in part because there's going to be so much more equipment when you're talking about the super short, uh, the, the the high frequency stuff, that the short range uh, 5G stuff, uh, you're talking about putting lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of little tiny towers all over cities. And that's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of revenue. Um, so, you know, Huawei's already embedded in a lot of countries at this point uh it, it you know i just thought it was interesting uh you know to finally see because we we haven't gotten a lot of it was just like hallway bad and one of the the sort of defcon insider backstory back channel kind of stories was somebody was like well it's not any worse than a lot of our equipment but you see our three letter agencies have access to our equipment, but our three-letter agencies don't have access to their equipment, and their three-letter agencies do. And <laughs> that was I will I will put that in the hype and rumor, the unsubstantiated claim uh, buckets. But uh, 
you know, it, it it's also interesting to look, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, that Mr. Sitariano points out is is um, that Huawei, uh, it, you know, excuse me, there's concerns about Huawei, but there's also greater concerns inside the British government, just like there are in the United States government, that uh, the China as a nation is doing a tremendous amount of hacking and trying to break into infrastructure and trying to steal uh, data and information. So um, I'm curious to see how it goes. Uh, you know, the, the kind of damning part on this report was that, uh, quote, there remains no end-to-end -end integrity uh, so they 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 couldn't really guarantee what software was going where at what time, uh, and that means, you know, we we talk a lot when we talk about open source programs. One of the advantages of open source is, hey, if the source is up on GitHub, for example, if you haven't heard about it, we talked about it on Tech Thing this week, uh, uh, Firefox Send, which is a open source tool that is allowing Firefox users to send up to 2.5 gigahertz files um, encrypted. Uh, end of, basically end-to-end -end encryption, uh, and they will sort of make those files available for up to a week. Uh, so if I am a code nerd, if I am a, 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 a you know talented programmer, I can go and I can read through that code and I can look for things that I don't want to be there. It's, you know, harder if not right, just flat out impossible to do that when you're talking about, uh, you know, private, you know, privately, it's just, you know, code that comes from a corporation, um, and then if they don't even really guarantee what they're putting, oh, you know, we'll whatever's fresh at that point. Um, you know, that's that's complicated. And I'm oversimplifying and, and drawing this this picture with crayons rather than anything particularly fine and detailed. But uh, it was interesting to see. Now, admittedly, you know, Great Britain is a longtime ally of the United States. They tend to sort of lean our direction and when the wind blows. But, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, they are very... Uh, uh, it was nice to see that that they were coming up with reasons to justify their concern, uh, and also it was interesting that the you know the the head of the National Cyber Security Center uh, that uh, you know we're just we're keeping their stuff out of the sensitive parts of the network. We have good oversight. There's no need to ban it. Just be aware. So we wait. There's definitely with some baited there's Definitely breath. some. <laughs> yeah. That's our tagline. That's the catchphrase. <laughs> There's obviously some paranoia involved with this. I mean, obviously, Huawei does a lot more than just make 5G equipment. But right, you know, their mobile phones are, I think, second in the world. But they're they're huge in Asia right. and some of the other countries. But here, it's just become almost like a dirty word because it's so maligned by the government and it's. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're just they're concerned that they don't have the control over it that they do from some of these other countries, companies, even if the products are made in China. And let's face it, almost everything's made by Foxconn. Right. They they just don't have that same relationship with the company and the same understanding, i.e., uh, built-in backdoors to access anything, anywhere, anytime, like they do from some of the other companies. Sure. So there's concern over that like wait if if they have the potential to to send some of this information back to their country we're not comfortable with that because we like having everything go straight to our own government when needed or desired so if if it was a, a different country of origin this wouldn't be the same story it's not huawei as a company it's it's the government that they may or may not be subject to that i think is the concern which is a completely different matter. It becomes like the, it becomes a topic of discussion about technology and whether or not they make good products. And they actually do make really good products. They have some of the best phones in the industry, and mm -hmm. they have really great, you know, laptops and other things. But it becomes very controversial because, well, you know, the Chinese government may or may not be able to request access. Kind of the same way that the U.S. government can request access. So it's a two-edged sword. It is a double-edged sword, if you will. Yes. I, uh, I may, I, I don't know yet, but I may have the terrifying experience of speaking in front of the uh, state legislature here in the state of California uh, in uh, uh -huh. a couple of weeks. Um, 
hopefully it won't involve me being, you know, arrested or anything. But uh, in support of uh, the crew at iFix, of course, uh, have for obvious reasons an interest into right to repair acts. Uh, you know, they provide repair tools. They have their online database of, of how to's for repairs is up to like 50,000 articles at this point. It is massive and amazing and a tremendous resource and available absolutely free. You don't have to be an iFixit customer to get access to any of that. Um, iFixit, by the way, has been a sponsor on the show in the past. Uh, I've been using iFixit products for approximately forever. So please don't think this is advertorial. But uh, interesting thing came up on uh, Motherboard to, oh, goodness, yeah, like 9 o'clock this morning. Um, so one of the reasons why Right to Repair didn't pass the state of California last year is because Apple uh, lobbied incredibly hard against it. And Motherboard obtained a Apple internal document that pretty much says that uh, Apple is kind of they, they are spun up and ready. Should this legislature go through, they're pretty much going to be able to be ready to uh, get things going. But they, uh, you know, they are, uh, you know, this was dated April 18, so the document's almost a year old. It was titled Apple Genuine Parts Repair. Uh, and to quote, uh, to quote uh, Jason Cobbler up at Motherboard, um, the company has begun to give some repair companies access to Apple diagnostic software, a wide variety of genuine Apple repair parts, repair training, and notably places no restrictions on the type of repairs that independent companies are allowed to do. Uh, and the idea is that, uh, to quote Apple, companies, uh, independent repair companies can keep doing what you're doing with dot, 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 Apple genuine parts, reliable parts supply, and Apple process and training. And this, I think, is fantastic. Um you know, and would actually bring consumer, at least this corner of consumer electronics, a little more in line with uh, automotive repair. And I had a friend of mine who's very gung ho uh, about keeping government out of his everything. And, you know, he's a close friend and I get where he's coming from. Uh, but he also enjoys uh, relatively inexpensive car repairs uh, at a third party shop, uh, which has advantage, it has the ability, you know, to, use the latest diagnostic tools and what we discussed was that you know a lot of a car owner's right to be able to go somewhere other than the dealer to get work done is due to a bill that started in massachusetts and started to crawl across the nation and then was picked up by congress and, and made federal law so you know i like the idea of being able to fix things um I begin because oversimplification and bated breath uh, are kind of the themes. <laughs> that could be the title of the show: oversimplification and bated breath. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think it's great that Apple may stop pushing against right to repair. Uh, and you know, this is uh, this is interesting stuff. And it's not just it's not just Apple. Uh, you know, it's John Deere. Uh, is pretty notorious at this point. Uh, if you're in a rural or or, or you know farming community, uh, you've probably heard people kicking walls and throwing things against fence posts uh, with their irritation with John Deere and how their repair system works. But um, I'm very very curious to see where this goes. I'm very very curious to see what the right to repair bill and how it does here in the state of California. Uh, because it would be nice to have a stick to make companies make it a little bit easier for people to use things for a longer length of time and keep them out of landfills. So now, of course, that goes almost completely against the mandate that companies have from their shareholders. And of course, short-term shareholder family, family, short-term shareholder happiness is what drives uh, the executive teams at most companies, right? Make more money faster now so we don't get sued for not taking care of our shareholders. But, you know, it's it would be nice for products to be maybe a little thicker, a little better battery life, a, a bit less glue, uh, and a bit more screws, uh, you know, or or other devices or clips or things that that you know afford you the opportunity to keep using a product. I mean, the reason I gave up my iPhone six was not because it was particularly slow, but because it was the second time the GPS module on the main board had disintegrated, or not the GPS module, the compass. Uh, tool. And I just didn't feel like, you know, buying a brand new version of the same phone that was going to fail again. And I could not repair that particular part at that time. Um, 
I don't know. You know, I just want to give a shout out to that one and and uh, something for our audience to keep an eye on in their state. And uh, I'll put uh, links uh, in next week's show. I'll talk a little bit about where you can find information about the right to repair bills and what they actually mean. So, Warcraft one and two. Yes. Did you did, did you feel like this was like going back to your childhood? <laughs> well, I I got into gaming late uh, in my teenage years, but I absolutely love Warcraft two. I played the original Warcraft, but it's been so long I can barely remember it, but. Mm-hmm. I've played and replayed the various versions of Warcraft 2 or Beyond the Dark Portal, which was the expansion, and then the Battle.net edition, which was slightly revised. And this is funny to me because GOG.com today releases Warcraft 1 and 2 digitally for the first time ever. Right. And it was just a couple of years ago that Blizzard, when asked, was like, they're just not fun anymore. They're not, they're not that fun so they're, we're not going to re-release them. And then I was hoping this, this would come sooner than later when they released Diablo a couple weeks ago. Because obviously they have this agreement with Blizzard in place and these were coming. But here we mm-hmm. are, the end of March. We finally have Warcraft 1 and 2. It's like a $15 bundle to get both of them. So it's not a bad deal. No. And if even if you've played them over and over again, these are phenomenal games, especially Warcraft 2. It's just... I. It, it's pretty easy. I think that there are parts of the expansion that get pretty challenging. There's one in particular that's like a nightmare where you're going through almost like a minefield with boats. And it's very difficult. You have to manage resources carefully and stuff as you get into more difficult levels. But I, I just love these games to death. Very memorable, memorable soundtracks, memorable little mm-hmm. character voices and all the, the fun like kind of Easter eggs hidden in the game and stuff. So very very nice to see that you don't have to like find the files or like dump the files and configure dos box all that stuff anymore you can just download and install and i have not got the gog version yet but apparently the gog version of uh warcraft 2 has support for modern screen resolution so i don't know if that means they're doing like a uh, smoothing or if that means they're actually giving you the chance to do like a really high resolution thing should be interesting it would kind of change some of the levels a little bit if you could have everything on the screen at once but anyway i'm a fan i'm a fan of any of these older classic games being available again and it's I was just picking up on that <laughs> yeah it's it's odd to me that blizzard partnered with gog but hey why not it, it's only odd to me because blizzard has their own digital platform and they've released some of their older games like the original starcraft digitally where anybody mm-hmm. who has a Blizzard account can just log in and download it. But they, they didn't want to touch these Warcraft games. I'm not sure why, but GOG made the installers. They configured them. That's what they do. So they take on the responsibility of uh, supporting them. Support the game, people. Sorry, I was about to bellow out in some sort of strange 19th century <laughs> battle cry and then decided not to blow anybody's hearing out. Uh Cinemas R20 uh, is going to be available outside of Microsoft Store, or as you started that sentence, Maxon reverses its yeah. course. It What's does. What's going on with that? Yeah. No, and this was one of those, I find it personally kind of detestable when these things come out and they're exclusive to Microsoft Store. I don't know why it is. I just have always felt since I started using Windows that applications are kind of these portable things that you can install from anywhere from a thumb drive, from you know a website if you download it. And being tied to the Windows Store was obviously very limiting. And it was odd because if you've done any benchmarking in the last several years, Cinebench is like a standby of people doing CPU benchmarks or any kind of total system benchmark for performance. Right. And Cinebench R15 has been used forever well, you know, since 11 and then 10 before that and so on. But R20 comes out and we're like, okay, a new version of Cinebench to start making it part of our, our standard test suite of applications for CPUs. And then it was exclusive to this UWP environment. And what was interesting about it was this was artificial, obviously, because right. there were workarounds and 
Guru 3D was hosting like the standalone file or the instructions on how to make the standalone file, and Microsoft was threatening them with legal action. Or I'm sorry, Maxon was threatening them with legal action because of whatever agreement they had with Microsoft that was in place that was exclusive to their store. And this blew up in their face, and a lot of the outlets that would have been using this application were instead... Stopped. <laughs> yeah, would not use it, were condemning it, were reporting against it. And I was seeing things like on Lifehacker, like how to make your own portable installation of Cinebench R20. And then they just completely reversed course and like, oh, hey, it's, it's a zip file. It's like it always was. You can just download it straight from their website or any of the other sites that are going to be hosting this file now. I downloaded it yesterday. It's just a 200 meg zip file. You open it up, you run the application from the inside of the folder. There's no installation involved. So just like the previous versions of Cinebench. So if you are enthusiastic at all about benchmarking stuff or if you do this for a living like I do, it's nice to have portable benchmarks like this that you can put on any platform and not have to use any dedicated storefront for it. But that's kind of been the theme of the last couple of years. Is everybody wants their own exclusive content, whether it's TV, like Apple TV Plus is just a bunch of exclusive content and mm -hmm. of course the epic game store competing with steam and so on and so on so microsoft wants a piece of that obviously it's just funny to me that they would make this decision for a commonly available free benchmark but hey hey you know it's there's somebody somewhere and it, this is a very large company with a billion layers and someone somewhere in there was like this is great we're gonna get it's going to be amazing. It's going to, and then, you know, the wheels fell off and the sparks flew behind the carcass of the vehicle as it ground itself down on the highway. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, good for Maxon for, for changing their mind. I, it's interesting to watch. Uh, I don't know. It, it's been interesting to watch certain chunks of software only show up in the Microsoft store uh, and certain chunks of software to remain steadily steadfast uh, outside of the store and to watch kind of the battles, you know, are you sure you want to install this non-signed code that could be, well, in my case, an inexpensive and free tool that people I know who can spend as much money as, as Facebook has on encoding tools, then they use this open source tool instead of spending money. Are you, are you sure? You know, I mean, it's it's uh, it's interesting to see how the operating system reacts and and how that relates to the to the Microsoft Store, and just how irritating it can all get, and how quickly it can all get so irritating. I don't know. My, my biggest issue with the, with the Microsoft Store is is there's an application uh, that I used to use for network testing that was only available uh, through the Apple Store because it was just nice because somebody had taken a bunch of open source stuff and put a nice functional interface on it made it really, really easy to run. Uh, and then they decided to pull it off the store. And of course, there's no discrete way of downloading it. <laughs> so even if you've paid for it, once it's gone, it's really hard to install that on a new machine. Or if there's some secret, you know, place inside of the Google Store, I don't, the Google, the Microsoft Store I don't know about, uh, please. Email. <laughs> Tweet deck, no. Um, <laughs> total brain spasm there. Uh, email uh, uh, twitch at twit.tv or tweet at Patrick Norton. Or if you want to really confuse things, tweet at Sebastian Peak and he'll be like, why are you telling me about this? What is the application use... even called? Are you talking about iPerf or is it something else? Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 you know, it's it's kind of it's a cousin to iperf um, that was uh, compiled and set up to run okay. with iperf clients. I want to say it was iperf, um, but it was just it was nice. I I just I hate running iperf off a command line. This allowed me to do it in a window, and it was really really clean and effective. So uh, maybe I, I should check to see whether or not uh, whether or not somebody's done a better uh, UI for that, or I could just you know hitch up my big boy jeans and go back to dealing with iperf in the command line but it it just <sighs> it's not my I'm, favorite I'm, thing to do i'm anti-command line when it comes to benchmarking it's just so much easier to have like shortcuts yeah and actually be able to look at what you're doing that's why i use ocat instead of using like present mon through the command line for benchmarking graphics cards and i've always used the gui like the gui for handbrake i don't use the 
it, I'm sure there are people who just can type all the commands they want with all the little um, contingencies and everything, all the settings right. for Handbrake, but I just give me a preset or let me make my own. It's a lot easier that way. Yeah, I don't know. I have friends who grew up in, in Unix environments that, that can do the whole magnificent, amazing uh, living from the... the uh, Living from the command line, but I don't think I'm quite one of them yet. <laughs> and probably will never be at this point. Have you seen, uh, one last thing before we go, have you seen killedbygoogle.com? No. So killedbygoogle.com uh, is a web page that lists uh, pretty much everything that Google has killed off. Um, it does not... Uh, <laughs> oh, there's services things thing. that Thank they... Yes. Yeah. Um, Can I just point out, know, for anybody watching the video, this looks exactly like the Windows 10 settings uh, application. <laughs> it's all white with thin uh, black fonts. I've, I've been having <laughs> terrible flashbacks to trying to find things in Windows 10, but please continue. So if you if you click over to hardware, there are 12 entries, the Chromecast Audio, the Google Search Appliance, the Chromebook Pixel, the Google Nexus, Project Aura, the Nexus Player, Revolve, Google Glass, the Google Play Edition, Google TV, Nexus Q, uh, which barely was around for several minutes, and Google Mini, which was the tiny version of the uh, Google Search Appliance, which essentially was a, a rack-mounted uh, document indexing device. When you get into services and apps, services, uh, oh, yeah. uh, it's crazy. What's also interesting about this, at least to me, is is it doesn't include things that they have fundamentally ab abandoned development on, but have not necessarily killed, for example, feed burner. Uh, you know, Google Reader, of course, is the thing that people are still angry about. It's been five years since Google Reader, uh, you know, got let out behind the barn like old Yeller, uh, and people are still pissed off about that. <laughs> I was a daily Google Reader user. I tried yeah. to use, you know, other things, and then I ended up just using Twitter. Subscribe to all the sites I used to follow on Google Reader, but right, yeah, it's it's amazing to look at this list and see there's 150 things on here. Yeah, a dozen, and I'm I'm still mad about Nexus not no longer being a brand. I just I loved my Nexus devices, but obviously they have Pixel. But you have now. Pixel. That's true. I, I like Nexus. Much more I don't want a chipper little pixel. I want Nexus. I want something that sounds like it's found on the bridge of the Enterprise. Um, well, I mean, the, the Nexus program was, you know, the replicants <laughs> in Blade Runner. And you know, I'm a Blade Runner fan, so, hey, whatever. Oh, you know, it didn't even occur to me that. Wow. Apparently, it's been quite some time since I watched the original Blade Runner. Um, and that, obviously, is my homework for this week. I'm going to be talking about uh, some... Desktop monitors uh, from KEF and hopefully from SVS and Edifier. Uh, three of the names that are out there. They're doing some really nice audio, audio file -y kind of stuff uh, at some very wide uh, and far-ranging price points. And uh, looking at uh, some headphones and, oh, by the way, looking at some hardware of the more traditional PC sense, uh, doing a build uh, that I'll share with you guys in the next week or two. Uh, also, probably want to talk a little bit about memory timing and how uh, really, as much as I want to get excited about making memory run faster, it very rarely has any kind of a real-world effect on overall system performance, uh, at least once you get it to a certain point. Um, if you want to buy incredibly expensive memory, go forth. Uh, but don't be surprised if you don't feel any kind of real difference when you, uh, when you fire it up. You are uh, buried under a pile of objects that you are reviewing right now. Is there anything you can call out and tease for us? Well, I'm trying to think of all the stuff. There, there's the stuff that's close enough to being ready. I'm still going through the ultra high-end Asus motherboards that I've been working on for a while. The like extreme alpha and omega boards that between them I think are like $1,400. They're like the highest end imaginable boards for both AMD and NVIDIA enthusiast platform or AMD and Intel enthusiast platforms. And, you know, some more cases. I'm actually benchmarking memory for the first time in like five years. Oh, Companies, well, I'll just stop researching that and wait for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, when I started at PC Perspective five years ago, my very first article, which 
you talked about the next day, oddly enough, on this very program, was a a pair of memory sticks that was, you know, it was back in the DDR3 era, but they were clocked at like 2,666 megahertz, which was crazy, considering DDR3 started at like 1,600 megahertz. And I was trying to figure out how to benchmark this. Like, okay, I've got this memory. What do you do? I mean, you can run synthetic benchmarks all you want, but what's the real world uh, application of fast memory? And it's especially important over on the AMD side. So I was having fun playing like at lower detail settings, but still using like a Ryzen 5 uh, 2400G that has the built-in Vega 11 graphics and pumping up memory frequencies. I have it running at like 3466 and like tightening down the timings and seeing how many frames per second I can squeeze out of it. So that's coming. Uh, and just, you know, more of the same, more coolers, more cases. No big launches on the horizon uh, until, of course, I hear otherwise. I'm sure we'll have some CPUs <laughs> fairly soon. But hey, you know, maybe, maybe it's finally maybe. starting to calm down. After a crazy first three months of the year, we might actually yeah. have a break. Like, Every stuff. time you say that, something comes out of nowhere and you spend no. 48 hours strapped in that room. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I'm getting excited about Ryzen 3000, but I get excited about new CPUs because that's the way I roll, people. If this is your first episode, ladies and gentlemen, this is This Week in Computer Hardware. We call it Twitch. You can find it at twit.tv slash twitch. Uh, you can see our shiny faces right now if you're watching the video. And if you want to learn how to subscribe, everything you need to know is at twit.tv slash twitch. And uh, you can stream the episodes from there. You can get your favorite RSS feed and get whatever you need to get that into your life. Whatever kind of podcatcher you want to use to do it, we are ready for you, people. The uh, gentleman with the hair of the gingery reddish color. That would be Sebastian Peak. Uh, I am the one with the hat because my skull, which has no hair, was looking a little shiny today. I didn't want to blind Sebastian or Kevin or anybody out in the audience, so I am behatted today for the safety of all those around me. Uh, you can find me over at techthing.com. Sebastian, by the way, pcper.com. If we didn't mention that or if I didn't mention that, I apologize, but it is an amazing website, chock full of hardware review excellence. Uh, and you can find me over at techthing, T E. K-T-H-I-N-G.com, where uh, I was really excited about Killed by Google and uh, spent a lot of time talking about, not a lot of time, it was interesting to look at all of the security patches inside of iOS 12.2. If you're running an iOS device and there's a operating system upgrade for that, do it now. Um, because there are some awkward holes inside of that. And uh, we talk about that in some of the uh, newer features. I got to say, they put an air quality index inside of uh, Maps. And I'm fascinated by that. And given that you know we are getting to the burning season here in California, uh, I think that's a very, very useful feature because I can look and see parts of the state I want to avoid or when it's time to strap the masks onto the children so they aren't hacking up phlegm all night. <sighs> so much fire in California. So many trees. So many towns burning. Hey, speaking of burning, make sure you've backed everything in your life up just in case your house burns down. That's a cheerful thing to end on. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and not just within the house. Understand that if your house burns down, yeah. that external hard drive is of very little use to you unless it was in some sort of incredibly expensive uh, multi-layer fireproof thing. But thing. yeah, online backup is a good Three thing. copies on at least two different kinds of media at least one off-site. There's a reason so much of my life is backed up on Backblaze um, because their servers are not here. You know, here, here, where I am, we have earthquake issues and I'm surrounded by water and they, you know, half the state's burning at any given moment. I exaggerate slightly, but a lot less than it may sound. So back up your data, hug your children, say nice things to your neighbors. And remember, just be nice, actually. <laughs> I've got, apparently my caffeine is wearing out and I'm losing what was left of my mind. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Sebastian Peake. We'll catch you next week on Twitch. 